Welcome to Flipping the Table. Today, Michael talks with Will Harris of White Oak Pastures, located in southwest Georgia. Will's family has raised cattle and crops there for six generations, but after World War II, an industrial farming approach took over and the degradation of land and community began. In the 1990s, after a decade of cattle production, like his father, Will had an epiphany and began to produce food regeneratively. Today, Will shares with Michael his journey to healing and community wealth generation. Enjoy the show. About 180 miles south-southwest of Atlanta, along State Highway 27, you will come to Bluffton, Georgia, which is in Clay County, up against the border of Alabama. Clay County is one of the poorest counties in the nation. But one farm is helping to rebuild its economic prosperity and its future. That farm is White Oak Pastures. And my conversation today is with its leader, Will Harris. It is interesting to note that in the 1790s, the town of Bluffton and Clay County were the center of a failed attempt by the Cherokee and Creek tribes to join with European colonists who had been resisting slavery and the planter class that wanted to push the tribes and small farmers out to claim the land. There is a humanistic, dare I say, forward-thinking streak in Bluffton that has blossomed again over the last 25 years. It points the way to a better world. Will Harris and his embrace of a regenerative farming system has been the catalyst for that blooming. I believe Will's adoption of a better way, which clearly includes an indigenous appreciation of holistic thinking and practice, will survive, unlike the attempt in the 1790s. Will has just published with Viking Press a book about his journey titled A Bold Return to Giving a Damn, subtitled One Farm, Six Generations, and the Future of Food. The title says a lot. I thought about the phrase, a bold return to giving a damn. As I interpret that, I hear a deep frustration with industrial agricultural systems that have not given a damn about their impacts on the land, the animals, the people, and the communities in which they operate. I believe you will enjoy hearing about the moment that moved Will to change his farm. You will be inspired by his openness about the challenges, the risks, and realities faced, and then the sense of fulfillment and gratitude he feels about how his now expansive operation has brought his two daughters back to the farm and amazingly revitalized the town of Bluffton, which had been in severe decline for nearly 100 years. His story points the way for the much-needed revitalization of rural places across the entire nation and perhaps the planet. Will's story is about how one person can spark a farm's, a land's, and a community's healing. Let's begin. Will Harris, great to see you via Zoom. Really appreciate, actually, you taking the time because I know you're a busy guy running the ranch. I'm grateful to be on with you, Mr. Dillon. Uh, thank you for having me. Yes. So why don't we jump in? I, you know, in the introduction to this, I, I explained that your your new book is out and that you are telling the story, your story of your life and what you've learned and what you've brought to the world. And I thought it would be really nice to hear from you the nine commandments that you've used to kind of guide your life and your work, because I think it tells us a lot about who you are. And you can weave in, you know, your origin story. Well, uh, so I, I don't have them in front of me, but uh, I'll, I'll tell you the story about how they came about. So, you know, I'm, I was raised in Bluffton, Georgia. Bluffton is in Clay County. Clay County was the poorest county in the United States of America in 2020. So it's very economically impoverished area. And, uh, and it's in the Bible Belt. And, that, and that's a big deal. And it's kind of a local joke that there are. There are three kind of people. There are really good people that go to church. There's really bad people that don't go to church. And there's the Harrises. And, 
<laughs> that, that was us. That was my family. And, uh, we, you know, my, I saw my daddy in church twice, uh, my wedding and his funeral. And, oh, wow. So you were uh, somewhere in the middle of your family. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he was a good man. I brought that up to, to say that I, the Ten Commandments that, you know, I was taught uh, along the way, it always seemed to me like it was a heap of, uh, about what not to do. And I guess that's fine. I figured I was good on 70% of them, probably not <laughs> not 80 or 90, but 70. But uh, I wrote my own commandments about what they were in, in a positive way, what I would do, how to treat the land and the animals and the community. And they're listed in the book. I can't recite them to you. <clears throat> but it's the way I've lived my life, and I've been I've been very happy with it. You know, I, I don't. I think I I pray devoutly, but I don't do it in the building in town. I do it in the pastures. We 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 move cattle every Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Yeah, to me, nature is a spiritual place, so I can totally relate to that. Well, why don't you tell people just a little bit about the history of the farm, going back to the 1860s and the generations that preceded you? My great grandfather came to this farm, Bluffton, Georgia, actually just south of Bluffton, Georgia, in 1866. Uh, he had had a, a farm in Quitman County, which is about 60 miles from here, that he somehow lost in the Civil War. I mean, there's a lot of different stories about how that happened, but it was a he was fortunate in that he had an uncle who was a medical doctor in Bluffton who started him over a hill you know, on the farm we have today in 1866. He farmed the land all his life. His son, my grandfather, farmed the land all his life. And then my dad came back and took over the farm in 1945. He was born in 1920, so he was 25 years old. And that's, that's kind of where it got interesting because my dad uh, really industrialized the farm. You know, we don't know a tremendous amount about how the farm was run under my great grandfather and grandfather, except anecdotally, it would have been a multi species farm. It was a pretty, pretty large farm. And they sold direct to consumers. And, uh, I know some stirs about that, but it, my dad took over the farm post World War II, and that was when agriculture really industrialized. And the industrialization went into hyperdrive after the war. And my dad changed it to a monoculture of only cattle and uh, moved the farm to a very linear industrial kind of operation. And he was very, very good at it. And he was uh, successful financially. We weren't rich people, but he, he made money and paid for the land, bought some more land, paid for it. And it was, it was a success story. I was born in 1954. I uh, went to the University of Georgia, majored in animal science. And I never wanted to do anything except come home and run the farm as an industrial cattle operation the way my dad had done it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. And uh, I ran the farm very, very industrially for 20 years or so to the mid mid 90s. Mid 90s, I really changed it dramatically. Before we get into that, I want to comment on something you said in the book. You talked about how you went to work after you left the farm. You went to work for a company and and uh, that was really in the industrial system. And it reminded me of a story. I don't know if you've ever met Lauren Poncha. He runs a a similar operation, Stemple Creek out in California in Marin County. He had a very similar experience. He grew up on a ranch like you. He went to Cal Poly, studied, and then he went to work for Monsanto and worked for them for three years and then worked for a large, basically selling pharmaceuticals for the industrial system for many, many years until he had a certain moment that changed his mind. He had an epiphany. And when I read your book, I had just had dinner with him where he told me the story. And then I read your book and you had a similar moment, a, an epiphany moment, which I found very compelling on page 48. I'm actually quoting it in my book because it was so powerful to me. So can you tell people what that was? Uh, yeah, I mean, Lauren's story and my story are very, very similar. And uh, I, when I graduated from the University of Georgia, I, I was naive enough to believe I was going to come home and that my dad was going to go to the house and sit down and I was going to run the farm. But he <laughs> was not up for that. He, was, you know, he would have been much younger than I am now. 
So he insisted I go find a job somewhere, and I, I did. I found a job with an agricultural cooperative called Gold Kiss. It's no longer in business. And I worked for them, and it was, it, was, it was quite successful. I became a regional manager, which was – I was the youngest regional manager they ever had by a decade. But I did come back and take over the farm later, and I was very happy doing it. And I made money every year. I actually went back and looked, and I paid taxes every single year that I ran the farm until I until I did, made the decision to transition over. Like I can remember distinctly, it was, it was 1995. We were loading a load of cattle out. I was shipping them to the Midwest. It was, they were steer cattle. There was uh, about a hundred, five hundred pound calves that I raised, and it just I've done that. Dozens and dozens and dozens of times. But that morning, it just hit me completely different. It, you know, we put those calves that I'd raised uh, on that truck, double decker truck, the ones on the top, urinating and defecating on the ones on the bottom. And they were going to be on that truck for 30 hours without food or water or rest. And these were animals that were born on my farm and I cared for them all their life. And for the first time, it bothered me. It never had bothered me before, but it did. So I, I just made up my mind that morning I was going to do things different. I didn't have a plan. I just was going to do it different. When I read that, and Lauren said a similar thing, he said he would raise these cattle and they were beautiful. And then he would get a report back from the feedlot that talked about their health problems that they were having. And he knew when he shipped those animals, they were really healthy. And so what I saw in your story and in his story, there's a love for the animals. There's a love for the animals. And that kind of when you see and you start thinking about the impact, it kind of opens you in a different way. I I took that from your story. Yeah, and I, I had I did have exactly that same experience. And and you know, we and I actually engaged in another practice called retained ownership. And that would be where I would ship my animals to the Midwestern feedlot or Western feedlot, and I would still own them. They would feed the animals for me, but I paid for the feed. I paid for any pharmaceuticals, any medical treatment they gave them. And when one died, I'd get a death report. And it was always amazing to me how much sickness and death I had in those feedlots. And, and you know, I kept their sisters. I, I seldom would have an animal die. Of, of, of uh, inexplicable means, I mean, but I mean, lightning could hit one. I mean, we seldom had a dietary problem. It seems odd, but even at the time, and it was economically costing me money to do that, it didn't seem odd to me. That was just the way the system worked. And my mm-hmm. dad had done it, and I did it, and it was fine. And I made money with it. You mm-hmm. know, I made less than I would have if the animal hadn't died, but on the group, I made money. Mm-hmm. It's amazing what you can get used to. Yeah. Uh, good point. That That's the whole culture, isn't it? Um, so now you had this moment and you made a decision. And when you read the book, you realize it was an incredible journey. Like, like you see in a, a movie, like the hero's journey. It's like an arduous path. All these things you have to overcome to, to basically build a new system. So, and 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 you described you use the word husbandry. Wendell Berry uses the term husbandry around caring for animals. So I, it would be really interesting for you to just to share some of that. Like, what were the things that you learned, and what what challenges did you have to face as you built this new system? Well, I, I'll, I'll tell you. But uh, what's interesting is you mentioned husbandry, and you know the major I had at the University of Georgia had previously been called animal husbandry. But before I graduated, it was, it was changed to animal science. Yeah. And that was that's a really significant change. Yeah. Husbandry is much less linear, much more cyclical. Uh-huh. Animal science is just epitomizes a very linear way of doing business. And that, that, that's important that people understand. So when I had that that little uh, that moment that morning loading those those steer calves to be shipped out west. I, I, I suddenly for the first time ever I just didn't want to do that anymore. And and, and really in, in retrospect that was a terribly naive way of making a business change. It was just what happened. 
So I started giving up things I didn't like. You know, I, I, I didn't ship any more cattle to the West. And I didn't uh, use any more subtherapeutic antibiotics. I didn't use any more ionospores. I used less and less chemical fertilizers, pesticides on the pasture. I eventually didn't use any. Just started making really big changes that, that impacted me financially a lot. And I went from making money every year to not, not making much and then not making any and just not doing well. And I realized that. I mean, this this is what I do for a living. I had young children. You know, I had to make money. I had to, this yeah. just, you had to work. So I realized I either had to go back doing it industrially or change the rest of the program. So I changed the rest of the program, which meant uh, I created a beef brand, White Oak Pastures. That was, that was, White Oak Farms was the name of the farm. I started calling the brand White Oak Pastures and found customers to buy the product. And it was just a little bit at first, but it got more and more. And my, my timing was so, so fortunate. I, I, not, not good, not intentional, but just so happened. But I sold public supermarkets and Whole Foods Market, the first grass-fed beef that they ever bought and marketed as grass-fed beef. What year would that have been? 2001. Uh, we, I was already selling some product direct to consumers, but I couldn't sell enough. And we were able to get in those stores, and that really caught traction. And we built a slaughterhouse, uh, and uh, you know, we, we went on from there. The economic side of it was very difficult at first, and, and then it got, it got. We had some really good years, and then the economics has gotten tough again. The amount of imported product that's brought in today and marketed as product of the USA because the mandatory country of origin labeling went away. You know, most of the most of the grass fed beef that's sold in this country comes from New Zealand or Australia or Uruguay or other foreign nations. Yeah, that is a that is a major problem. I know that, you know, Kerry Balkum, I know a good friend and colleague of yours from mm -hmm. the American Grassfit Association. We've talked about that often and the, the challenge of getting the United States to do the right thing by our own producers of grass fed beef in this country by, you know, requiring that we have country of origin labeling again so that people know where it's coming from uh, well, because we really don't have control over those other nations. And the, the big multinational meat corporations are just so politically powerful. I went to the JBS website a couple of months ago, and I I saw their their grass fed story from Australia. That you know, and and you know, they they are really trying to get in and co opt this thing that that you and some other pioneers have started. So it is a, it is a major challenge when. JBS is controlling probably fifty percent of the beef market in the world. One company. But, you know, as long as they label it properly, I'm fine with it. I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying we should not import beef from other countries, but we should label it as, as being from the other country and certainly not label it as being a product of the USA, which right. is legally done now. And it's a lie. So, yeah. Well, can you talk a little bit about, because in your book, you describe as you began to do these things, Things began to change on the farm. Things evolved and a new kind of environment bloomed in a certain way. Things came back to probably the way they were in your grandfather's day and your great grandfather's day. So do you want to describe that for people so they understand what you experienced on your farm? Yeah, I, I guess the part that is most, uh, I guess, documentable would be the organic mount in the soil. Organic mount in the soil is a number on a piece of paper but it has great impact. And the organic model on my farm was a half a percent till I start till I ceased to till it and use chemical fertilizer and pesticides. And now it's over five percent, which is a 10x increase. Yeah. And that's just very, very powerful. It it uh, the uh half percent organic model soil is a dead mineral medium, like a handful of glass beads. A 5% organic amount of soil is just teeming with life. Just all kind of life. Some of it you can see, some of it you can't see, but it's a living medium. And that occurred because of the way I changed our farming methods. And of course, that impacts the 
nutrient density of the forage that I make, which impacts the health of the animals that I produce, and I hope impacts the nutrition of the people that eat that beef. You know, the, the first three of those, I can tell you it does that because I can see it. The last one, I hope it does, and intuitively, I believe it does. Well, there's science coming out. You, you must know Spencer Smith. No who, yeah, Spence, we did a podcast two months ago, three months ago, and he he went through the new studies that are coming out showing the nutrient density increase from grass-finished meat. You know, I think that I, I certainly absolutely believe that, but I have made a policy that I, I speak on animal welfare, re- regenerative land management, and local rural economy building, because I'm an expert on those three things. Mm-hmm. I, I've, I've done more of them than most people. And when it comes to nutrition and health and these other attributes, I have beliefs that I, I think are true, but I leave that to the experts to, to argue. I, I'm just aware I sound really stupid talking about conjugated linolenic acid and omega-3s and omega-6s. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good policy. So so the soil kind of was the beginning of a cascade effect across the farm in terms of, of all the different changes. But you also began to add species. Can you talk about that? I was able to run this farm, a fairly large farm, as a monoculture of cattle because I used all the industrial tools. When I ceased to use the industrial tools, and that's, I mean, we're talking about pesticides, antibiotics, you know, all kind of, anything that is inside, herbicide, et cetera. When I ceased to use those, it, it started falling apart. And, you know, I needed the other species. Because, you know, I, I say that nature abhors a monoculture, and I had a monoculture of only cow. And really a monoculture of only Tifton 85 Bermuda grass in the pastures that I planted and cultivated and used herbicide on to keep, to, to make it uniform and consistent. So when I gave up using those reductionist tools, it, it started falling apart. So we added the other species in an effort to emulate nature. We added, the first, I think the first, first species I added was sheep. Because there were things in the pasture that the cows wouldn't eat. I had only Tifton 85 Bermuda grass, and the cows ate it. I quit using the herbicide. Other species came. The cows didn't. Yeah. So one thing just led to the next and the next and the next. So you know, we uh, eventually wound up at 10 species, and you know, we may go to 11 or 12 or 13. I don't know. It just depends on what we need and also on what's marketable. You know, we, yeah. we make our living – marketing the bounty of this farm. Why don't you tell people what those species are? Because I think it's quite interesting. Cows, hogs, sheep, goats, rabbits, chickens, turkeys, geese, guineas, ducks. And we have a garden. In addition to those two species, we have a vegetable garden. Uh, we experiment with some nut species, pecans and other things. Nice. Uh, I really like permaculture. I don't know much about it. So we're kind of kind of dabbling in that just a little bit. But there's just the bounty of the land that spins off it, that, that we need to monetize to make our living is really a beautiful thing. You know, all the wealth initially came from the the bounty of the land. Yep. Production excess of the land. All that coal and oil and gas in the ground was the bounty of the land when the systems were operating optimally. Yeah, it's interesting to me in a way. I mean, many people have taught, Alan talks about the savory, others about how so many civilizations fell because they really didn't know how to manage their resources. And other pioneers like yourself are are kind of rediscovering that regenerative, great term, really descriptive term of what's happening now. It's not like organic or sustainable. It's regenerating, bringing it back to a time after humans have kind of you know, we've degraded things because we haven't been thinking holistically as you're doing now and thinking about mimicking nature of you described. So it is a wonderful thing to see. As I read the book, there's a lot in there about all of the dark side of industrial agriculture, all the harms it has caused really to communities, economically, uh, to people individually, to the animals and to the, to the soil and the biology, the ecosystems as a whole. And so I'm just curious about, you describe it well in the book about the emergence of what you started to do for the community, because 
a ton of benefits. You went through all these challenges and financial challenges. I mean, you're really stark and honest about the fact that you had to shoulder debt when your dad told you you shouldn't do that. You, let's talk a little bit about that, actually, before we get into the other benefits. Just talk about what it was like to take on debt. Well, my dad, uh, again, born in 1920, was a child of the Depression. I guess from the time he was 10 years old through whatever, there was a Depression era farm in a poor part of the country where many, many, many people lost their farms, lost their land. And, and my family did not. They lived frugally, lived hard, and made it through the Depression, still owning the farm. And they were, he was always very proud of that. And they did it by saving, 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 living very frugally, working hard. And then uh, he thought that was the key to success. You know, my dad was uh, always carried a lot of money with him. I bet he didn't spend two dollars a week, but he just <laughs> loved the liquidity of having money in his pocket. Uh -huh. And uh, and he never borrowed money, and he told me to never borrow money, and I agreed to not, but I did. You know, when I made the agreement, I intended to live by it, but things changed when I inherited the farm. I was I was blessed. I was left with a, a thousand acres of land with no debt on it, good herd of cows, and, and Little, and some cash, and I made money myself. But then when I changed the way the farm, I ran the farm. I ceased to make money and started to lose money. And when I made the decision to build the slaughter plant and these other improvements that we made here, I had to borrow money, and I I did so very grudgingly, a lot of, a lot of angst, but I did it. And we owe money today, but it's been a we made it's been a good investment. What we spent money on has has paid for itself. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems to me that one of the innovations, uh, I mean, there's obviously industrial agriculture points out some of the the challenges of a capitalist system, but one of the things that an innovation really uh, uh, is the use of debt in a business. There is a smart way to use debt, and I guess you've done that. But I think it is hard for a lot of rural families with ranches and farms to to make that jump, that willingness to risk in that way, because the risk is so great, right? You could lose your property. And so many have since the 80s in our time. Yeah, and I think uh, I'd like, like to take a very noble posture on that. But I think your know, naivety had more to do with it than anything else. But for me, I, I thought it'd be all right. And I, I made, I, I borrowed the money and, and it was all right, but it could have not, it could have gone the other way. And I'm very aware of that and very grateful that it didn't. And I have two grown daughters and in-laws that are in the business with me today. And we talk about this a lot. You know, I don't want to make them promise they won't ever do one thing or another because business changes so rapidly, so dramatically. And I can't, I, Cannot imagine this farm without a cow. Uh -huh. It's a cow farm to me. I mean, we do a lot of other things, but I was raised as a cow. But, you know, I wouldn't ever say to them, don't ever sell the herd, because they may need to sell the herd. I mean, I don't, I don't know how that's going to work. That's an evolution in thinking from your father's generation. Yeah, well, and I've had, uh, you know, the, the fact is the time I was raised in, you know, I've had so much more business exposure. Than my dad had. My dad was a very smart guy, but he was raised in Bluffton, Georgia, population 100. He fiercely believed the things that he believed in and thought it should always be that way. So I fiercely believe that we got to change and adapt and, and, and do different. We hope you're enjoying the conversation. If you are, please rate our podcast and offer a review. Your voice will help us grow our listener base which helps us sustain the funding to share these conversations with the people and organizations shaping a more just and regenerative future. A future in which the food and farm businesses are helping to solve the largest challenges of our time. The thing that really inspired me about the book was, and you mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, I don't know if it's on the, on the, in the podcast recording, but about the fact that where you live was, is one of the poorest counties in the nation. 
And the book, you talk about what Bluffton was like when you were in the midst of the industrial system, what had happened to the community versus what it was in your grandfather's time. So can you talk about when you began to realize that it wasn't just about your farm and that things were that you were actually becoming an engine for for an economic revitalization? As I said earlier, initially, when I made my decision to change the way I run this farm in, in 1995, that morning in 1995, for me, it was all about the land. Well, that day, it was about the animal welfare, but it quickly became about the land. That all came together. So I made a lot of changes for the benefit of the land and the animals without any thought at all to the local economy. That never crossed my mind. Because it had been failing all my life. You know, I told you it started down in 1945. I was born in 1954. So it, I'd never seen anything except decline. And by the time I was old enough to appreciate what was going on, it was just generally understood that Bluffton would be a ghost town. It was on its way to it. There were other ghost towns we could look at and, and see where it was headed. And Renaissance changed with the animals in the land for, for 10 years. And I had a visitor one day, and he said, this is a nice little town. And it surprised me. I, I had to look at him and see if he was kidding, and he wasn't. And I said, you know, this is kind of a nice little town. <laughs> and the fact is, it was becoming a nice little town. It's just as important to me as the land and the animals now, but it came much later. It, it has come a long way, and it's going to be it's kind of beautiful. I mean, it's nice. I mean, it's not look nice in five-star accommodations, but it's just a very nice little place, and it's growing. We're adding people. I mean, my, I've gone from having four minimum wage employees in the mid-'90s to about 170 employees today. And, and my guys were minimum, minimum wage then. My people make well above the county average today. And that's not good. I mean, I, I wish I could pay everybody a lot more. Mm -hmm. But it's well above the county average. Mm -hmm. Clay County, Georgia, this county, was the poorest county in the United States of America in 2020. Mm -hmm. But we're, we're on our way up and we're doing better. That's amazing. We're the largest private employer in the county. Wow, that's a beautiful thing because I just last week drove all over the state of California and a week, two weeks before that, I was up in the far north, cattle country up far north. I mean, this in the Central Valley of California, the rural regions of this state are so deeply degraded economically. It is when I was a kid, it was nice. It's sad what's happened to, to this country's rural communities. So one of the most important things that I see with regenerative farming and this whole movement towards good food is that we're we're giving an opportunity back to rural regions. And you're a living, what you've done is a living example. Can you talk about some of the other things that you do besides produce meat and other things that are building off that in Bluffton? You know, white oak pastures without me intending to has become a economic driver in this county. It doesn't, it's not going to sound like much to, to, to big business people, but uh, you know, our payroll is, is uh, over $5 million a year, which in the poorest county in America is significant. Yep. And I'm very proud of that. And I wish it, I wish it was more. It probably won't be for a while. You know, we're about as big as we probably will be. I believe that this form of, of food production is not highly scalable but it's highly replicatable. So I believe that there can be a white oak pastures in every agricultural county in the country, or maybe more than, than one. I don't, I don't know how that, I don't know how that needs to look. You know, we can more clearly demonstrate the economic impact here than we can the impact of the land or the impact of the welfare of the animals. Those are the three things that are important to us. And really the most demonstrable is the economic impact. I'm very proud of our employees. We got a very high percentage of our people are not local. They moved here to be here, very educated. Most of them came from jobs where they made a lot more money than they're making now, but they made the lifestyle decision to move here and be part of this. It's very enlightening. It's also very rewarding. 
Well, you hit on something I think is extremely important for our country at this time. The fact that people would come to a community that had been historically economically depressed, but because of what you launched, you spawned there, they're coming to a healing for the land, for the community, maybe for themselves. Who knows everyone's deeper story, but they want to be part of something that is healing. I mean, that's what we need in this country right now. It's a lot more healing. There's so many divides. There's so much fear. And what you're doing is giving hope. And I, I'm just very impressed. And so beyond the economic rewards, it seems like there's other rewards that you're speaking to. You know, I graduated from the University of Georgia in 1976. And at that time, in that industry, uh, it was about getting a good job with a big national or international company and making as much as you can. And every year you make a little bit more, a little more responsibility, a little bit more compensation. And you work for them for 25 years and you retire. That was the dream. That's what everybody wanted. I was a little different, but just about all of my friends, that was what was very important to them. And how that has changed. You know, today, these young people that come here know they're never going to own white oak pastures. And they know they're never going to move up but so far uh, in the hierarchy. But they come here to enjoy life and to learn. And many of them have aspirations of going on somewhere else and farming for their own. And I hope they can. I've changed completely. I, my dad's generation, he, he had, you know, four or five employees that worked with him all their lives. They went to work together as young men and worked till they were old together. And I was on that same route. And uh, today our people come and go a lot and it's fine. We welcome them when they come. We celebrate when they decide to go somewhere else. I miss them. But it also gives me an open way to bring somebody else in with a different skill set, a different set of ideas. We, we, we have a lot of fun here. Two of my three daughters and their spouses chose to come back here. Uh, and they work hard, but it's just very rewarding. It's very enjoyable. And, and, and it feels very safe and permanent. I mean, you know, we don't make a lot of money. It could not be. You know, we could have an economic situation occur. But it, it feels really good. And you made it through the pandemic. I mean, uh, that must have been kind of a boom time in a way. The pandemic was a boom time. And it went a long way towards changing the way we operate. Uh, I should tell you that when we economically, uh, we peaked in profits in the 2000 and I guess six, seven, eight kind of a deal. And then we, it started going back the other way. And we didn't make as much money. And it was okay. We still made a little money. But it, it, it had reached the point that we lost money last year. And it was, and it was, you know, we could afford it. We could stand it, but we can't do it forever. And the reason is because the, the grocers, the big grocers that we depend on, one in particular, we had uh, just not able to do business with them anymore. We couldn't make money with them anymore. And I could speculate on why, but there's no reason to do that. But the fact is, I made this business. In, as a wholesale business, and it worked well, and the returns were were good, and I liked it, but it changed, and we needed to do something different, and the pandemic showed me that we could make it a direct-to-consumer business, and it's hard from Clay County, Georgia, because as I told you, this is not my market. Economically, the people here can't, can't buy my food in mass. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when the panic occurred and the grocery stores were out of food and people started ordering online from us, uh, we already had a little bitty inefficient online marketing effort. It showed us that this is pretty good. This, this could be a, this could be the salvation for us. So we started developing it. And this year, this year, so we, we, we sell about $25 million worth of product. And about two million of it was direct to consumer, and, and it was not profitable. Uh -huh. uh, this year, uh, half over half, I think, of our business will be direct to consumer. Great. Uh, 
and it's more profitable for us, and I feel more secure with it. I feel like, you know, somebody won't make a huge buy of Uruguayan grass-fed beef, and I won't be able to make a profit anymore. Mm -hmm. So that's a very interesting development, and I think there's a lot of other ranchers who I know in California work in a couple of big projects to bring more regenerative ranching in uh, to the fore. And most of these ranches are dabbling in grass fed right now. You know, they have, they're mostly commodity and they're, they're trying it out and they can sell their steaks to their neighbors or as quarters or whatever, but they're always stuck with a lot of grind and, and braising meats and, and stew meats. So we're, we've tried to create a, a supply chain that would supply the University of California's 10 campuses and five med systems with that meat. And if they want to go keep going, they have to build what you're doing. They have to build a direct to market consumer program. And how far and wide do you reach? And how far, I mean, how can some of our listeners find your beef or your other animals? On the online sales, we uh, I'm gonna say sadly, we ship to 48 states. I say sadly because I really I don't want to ship to 48 states. You know, I want uh, other other grass fed producers, these guys you're talking about, to be able to develop their own programs and, and you know and I don't know whether you know, I need to do $25 million worth of volume a year. That's what it takes to, to, for the infrastructure that I put together here. With the smaller geogra- geography I can sell it in, the better I like it. Uh, yeah. We sell uh, online to FedEx, UPS. They deliver again to 48 states. But I, uh, And I, I appreciate anybody's business that gives it to me. But I'm happy to help them get hooked up with Spencer Smith, who you mentioned, and Lauren, who you mentioned, and some of the other mutual acquaintances we've got that do a fantastic job with grass-fed beef all across the country. But you would love to be really supplying your state, neighboring states, kind of really localized. The smaller geography that I think we can all be in, the better off we are. You know, I, I'll never be able to, to make my living in Bluffton, Georgia. You know, we hundred people. You know that that's not going to work. So we got to reach out further than that. But you know, I'm right where Georgia, Florida, and Alabama come together. I mean, that that southwest corner of Georgia. So you know, New York and Texas are two of my biggest states that we ship to. But and we ship to anybody that buys it. But I hope I can help you find somebody local. Uh That's cool. So, but people can go to Waikato Pastures and find you if they want to try your meat. Uh, Because, I mean, I've never actually, I don't know if I've ever actually had any Georgia grown grass-fed meat. I'm going to make an order just so I can taste the difference between, you know, what you're doing and what other people doing. Be interesting to see. Well, I think ours is good. I think other people's good. I think that there's a terror noir that that occurs. You know, we have production advantages here that they don't have in other places. I can keep something green growing 52 weeks a year. Yeah. Uh, they have production advantages in other areas. You know, the uh, some of these guys in these more mountainous soils have got uh, greater mineralization than we do in this coastal ancient seabed we farm. You know, every area has got pluses. And mm-hmm. I, I was I was raised. My dad said, "This is the best land in the world, right here." Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yeah. No, it, 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 it's not. <laughs> he, he thought it was, but it, it, it's, it's really not. It's good. It's just fine. The things well, we do to make it better. Uh huh. You know what I like? Actually, a guinea hen. I I really love guinea hen. So I, I I think I might order one of those from you too, because actually you may remember um, Anya Fernald from Bel Campo back. I think that's how I met you. Maybe was way way back when we did Terra Madre in two thousand and four. Yeah, and I, the first time I ha- ever had a guinea hen was at her place at Belcampo before that all crashed. But it was a really great eating poultry. Well, my favorite poultry is guinea. By yeah, far. it's just wonderful. It's wonderful. How do you prepare it? How what do you like to do with it? Oh, I don't cook it. They cook it up there. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 they do anything with it. You do with the chicken. You know, uh-huh. but, uh, but it's, it's just it's just all good. Yeah, it is. Well, we've come to the end, but I just want to say one last time, Will, that uh, what you've done is is a beautiful thing. And it gives lots of people hope, not just in your community of Bluffton, but I mean, all around the country, how you've done it. 
your persistence. That's what really comes out in the book is that you're a person who, once you set your mind to it, you don't give up and you, you created something beautiful that's healing your community, the animals, the ecosystem and, uh, and humans' bodies. So congratulations. Thank you very much for your time. And I look forward to see you in uh, 2024 when I come through Georgia. I'm looking forward to you visit. It'll be a lot of fun. Thank you for listening. Roots of Change is a program of the Public Health Institute. 